Welcome to Beg to Differ, the Bulwark's weekly roundtable discussion featuring civil conversation across the political spectrum, from center left to center right. I'm Mona Charon of the Ethics and Public Policy Center, and I'm joined by one of our regulars, Bill Galston of the Brookings Institution and the Wall Street Journal. Linda Chavez and Damon Linker are off this week, but we are thrilled to welcome Bulwark publisher Sarah Longwell for her, I believe, second appearance on Beg to Differ. And our guest this week is Matt Iglesias, editor at Vox.com and author of a new book, One Billion Americans. Uh, This week featured the confirmation hearings for the very impressive Amy Coney Barrett. Uh, The Republicans had hoped that Democrats would impugn her religion, but those hopes were unavailing. Democrats had hoped that the nomination could be blocked somehow and that those hopes were equally unavailing. It was also a week in which another supposed deep state plot that Trump had fumed about for three and a half years, the alleged corrupt unmasking of Trump associates, went out with a whimper. And the commander-in-chief retweeted a conspiracy theory that Osama bin Laden, uh, sorry, that Obama had SEAL Team 6 assassinated and that the killing of Osama bin Laden was faked. Tonight, Biden and Trump will hold dueling town halls on different networks. Um, And one more thing before we get to uh, the One Billion Americans book. Um, The much-anticipated October surprise, courtesy of Russian disinformation, has arrived, and we will be getting to that in just a minute. But first, I do want to focus on Matt Iglesias' book, One Billion Americans. Matt, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, Thank you for having me. So I heard you on another podcast and I thought, huh, you know, that that's really an interesting premise. And I thought of you, I I have to confess, I'm not that familiar with your work, but I sort of thought of you as a man of the left. And and yet the way you sounded in that podcast really didn't seem all that left to me. And so I was interested in reading your book. And the first thing that jumped out at me was that um you're you're concerned about American greatness. You you're worried that you know our size could be a disadvantage vis-a-vis giants like China. So, talk about that for a bit. Yeah, you know this is an idea that I I, I heard it. I just heard the phrase "one billion Americans" somewhere, uh, completely random, and I started thinking about it, and I was really. Uh... <laughs> I was actually kind of taken by it uh, when I heard it because it connected a lot of themes that I care about. I mean, I'm a, you know, left or center person. I cover a lot of progressive policy ideas and, you know, people who work on immigration policy, people who work on on the welfare state and advocates for expanding it. And I like all those ideas, uh, but I, I am. I, I like America. I'm a patriotic person. And when I started thinking about the idea of population growth and what it could achieve, I was really more and more taken with it, with the notion that, you know, as we find ourselves increasingly preoccupied by an international competition with the People's Republic of China, as we see a lot of people for feeling that, you know, Donald Trump's message that we should we should care about American greatness, that has meant a lot to a lot of people in a way that I think matters, uh, no matter how little I think of him. Uh, But then you think about, well, what are the foundations of American greatness historically? And and one of them to me, I mean, literally, it's that we're a pretty big country, but also that we have taken advantage of our unusual status as a country with a real civic ideal to bring a lot of people in and, and assimilate them in a way that we are sort of comfortable with. You know, it's not totally non-fraught situation, but it's a real comparative advantage of the United States in the world that people can come here and and really be Americans and and their children can be Americans. And isn't this something that we should be deploying, you know, in a more sort of strategic way as we think about the United States and, and its role in the world? Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State, he said over the summer in a speech you know, he said, well, we don't need to accept American decline as inevitable. Um, 
it's uh, it's no coincidence that people want to move to our shores, not to China. And I, I heard that. I was like, yeah, that's right. That is that's correct. Um, and yet it's so at odds with the actual policies that the administration he serves in uh, are, are pursuing. So, you know, this is a book with I, I think a lot of ideas. And when you look at them are probably people on the left will be more comfortable with them. But the themes, I think, are do more speak to what people on the right are talking about these days. And hopefully that means, you know, we could have some kind of productive synthesis instead of the endless polarized culture war fighting that that uh, dominates the landscape today. Yeah, that, that struck me as I was paging through your book that uh, there really are cross-cutting themes here and there are aspects of it that will appeal to both sides, and, and maybe there can be a productive discussion. Frankly, we're just dying to get back to the times <laughs> when we can discuss matters of policy again. And uh, so, so let's give a little foretaste of what that might be. Let me let me press you on something. Mm-hmm. So you say size is important. You say the reason that you know when uh, Donald Trump was able to uh, pressure Canada on the uh, revised NAFTA treaty to take more American dairy products is because. Our market is so big and the Canadian, this gives us power uh, uh, vis-a-vis Canada as a much smaller market. So, so you say size matters, but you also say that, um, that size is important in order to be an innovative country. I'm not so convinced about that. I looked up the leading countries in innovation and a lot of them, there was a list of about 10, a lot of them were small, you know, Sweden and Denmark and Israel and places like that. So defend that, please. (laughs) <laughs> well, so uh, it's it's density, I think, is actually an important driver of uh, innovation, right? So you see big sort of innovations coming out of Stockholm, uh, as well as San Francisco and New York. Um, certainly Israel is one of the most densely populated countries on, on earth, even though it's quite small. Uh, you know, and on all these things, I would not want to make the claim that you know, population density is the driver of innovation, uh, because obviously Bangladesh has, you know, incredible challenges uh, that that prevent it from being a, a real landscape of, of that kind of thing. But the, the research to me is fairly clear that in a modern service economy, right, not a pre-industrial agricultural one, that places that have more people wind up having more opportunities for specialization, more opportunities for growth. You know, Adam Smith writes in the the 18th century that um, the limit of the market, the the extent of the market limits the division of labor. And so he's making the case there for trade internationally, right? You can specialize Mm -hmm. more with a bigger market. Uh, But so much of what we do these days um, is in-person services, right? You know, we're, we're cutting hair or we're we're a doctor, you know, we're a teacher, things like that. And you have a greater scope of a market in a sort of a big city, right? It's the reason right. there's there's like weird specialty shops in New York and Los Angeles and Chicago that just can't exist in, in small towns. And there's nothing wrong with living. Uh, there's great things about small towns as well. Uh, but having really big cities in a modern technological society helps drive things forward, I believe. Yeah, you gave a great example in your book. You said uh, in a in a small town, if there's a diner, it's going to have a fairly anodyne menu because they have to, uh, you know, uh, treat, uh, they have to appeal to lots of different tastes. And so they're going to sort of play it right down the middle. Whereas if you have a bigger city, then you can have the Korean barbecue place and the sushi place and the Italian restaurant and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, people specialize. And, you know, so some of this can just become a question of tastes, right? We know some people have a a psychological disposition where they really like variety. Other people prefer, you know, they're sort of meat and potatoes people. Um, They Mm -hmm. like small towns. And that's fine, too. I don't want to cast judgments uh, on anybody. Uh, It's just a fact that economically, where you have more ability to specialize, people can be more productive. You see higher wages in large metropolitan areas. And higher productivity. Productivity equals higher wealth for the entire country. Exactly. And especially if we can solve some of the housing issues that really bedevil uh, a lot of the, the sort of the blue states, the, right. the big the, the, liberal the housing issues. Areas. They are they are huge, and and as you know, um, they, they're some of the worst offenders when it comes to zoning. Are places like San Francisco and other Democrat-run places where it's really really hard to find affordable housing. But I, I want to get to your discussion of power, because if we're going to vastly increase the American population, 
Uh, we're going to need to power uh, all those homes and businesses and schools and so forth. And you um, you lightly touched on nuclear. I was glad to see that. Um, maybe a little too lightly for my taste. I mean, it, do you sure you don't want to come out f- with a full-throated endorsement of nuclear power? I, I felt my endorsement was fairly full-throated. I, I am <laughs> not... Um, a specialist in energy issues. I don't know exactly what a, an agenda for nuclear power would be. I, I did a, a podcast myself. I, I had someone on, uh, a woman from the University of Pittsburgh. She laid out her ideas about micro reactors, and it, it, it all sounded great to me. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I, I <laughs> it would have to be its whole other book with, with a whole yeah, other okay. line of, of research. You know, I have learned, you learn things when you promote books. Um, I have learned that the strain of uh, eco-catastrophism on the left is, I think, more widespread than I had realized. Um, and I did not address it at as full a length as I would have if I'd sort of gone back. You know, my basic view, I mean, look, this is a, a different audience from <laughs> what I get on some shows, and, and I'm, mm-hmm. sure, I'm sure your listeners know this, uh, but, uh, you know, climate change is... Um, it's a real issue. It's not it's not fake the way some people say and we should do things to address it, but it's not such a bad problem that we should like destroy the economy over it. Um or it, it's more to the point of the book, just completely give up on like supporting people who want to have large families and and raise children here or condemn people in the third world to endless poverty and immiseration, right? So, you know, like nuclear power, solar power, electric cars, there's a lot of things we can do. There's also a lot of sort of known unknowns, like, is there a way to make concrete in a lower carbon way? Like, we need research on that. So, you know, I, I both... I would like to see the American government do a lot more on climate change than it is currently doing, but I don't think the way some people do that it should be a controlling limit on how we think about everything in the world. So you are very pronatalist and you suggest uh, reforming some aspects of our family policy, namely the uh, marriage penalty that is hiding in the tax code. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So uh, there used to be a significant marriage penalty in the in the income tax code affecting sort of upper middle class people. And uh, the George W. Bush administration basically made that go away and it, and it hasn't come back. Uh, but for people in the bottom third of the income distribution, the way the, the welfare state operates, the way the EITC, child tax credit, uh, various other, you know, sort of social support programs create pretty severe marriage penalties uh, for lower income people. And uh, people at the Institute of Family Studies have done some some good research on this. It's it's suggestive that uh, the phase outs in these programs significantly reduce uh, marriage rates for, for working class households. This is the kind of thing that, you know, conservative people are more inclined to pay attention to. Um, but I'm not sure that they are willing to sort of solve the problem by just making the programs more generous, uh, which is, I think, the the most natural solution. You could, of course, make the program stingier, in which case you eliminate the penalty, but you're going to push lots of families with children back below the poverty line if you do that. Uh, So, you know, this is a, a topic where I think we should look at the work that conservatives have done on this issue, and then we should embrace the uh, progressive idea that it's okay to spend more money on helping people. Now, there's more than one way to increase the population. Um, there's also immigration. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, you're, you, you would, but you would have certain um, priorities in terms of which immigrants to admit. You, you wouldn't continue with the, you know, brother of the sister of the whatever that we currently have, the, the family chain migration. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, I am very enthusiastic about immigration. Um, I don't have a problem with the brother or the sister of whomever uh, coming. I think the empirical literature on immigration suggests that the average voter is just too pessimistic about it. At the same time, you know, we, we've we got to do politics for the real world here. Um, it is true that the current system... Uh, 
you know, it, it doesn't work quite as poorly as conservatives caricature it sometimes, uh, but it is fairly random. You know, whether you are able to get a visa at this point does not have a great deal to do with your personal characteristics. And so I think the idea of becoming more selective in the sense of like setting criteria, um, probably some mix of job skills, your age, your language abilities. I think reasonable people can differ as to exactly how to strike the balance there. Uh, But what you see in things like Tom Cotton's immigration bill is, well, he says, well, we should be much more selective about, you know, who we let in. And then we should also let in only half as many people. I think that if we can address some of people's concerns about immigration and make sure we're getting people who contribute to the tax base and who we feel by some definition, comfortable with culturally, you know, we should have more immigrants. And when you look at countries like Canada and Australia that are often used as the models for these points-based systems, they have more immigration than we do, not less, uh, because they are, you know, selecting people who who they think really contribute to the economy in a clear, strong way. And and I think we should we should genuinely emulate that, not say we're going to emulate it as a tool for cutting immigration. It's a shame that Linda's not here because she's the great immigration <laughs> expert. Um, <laughs> but um, all right, well, you um, you advocate for um, year-round schooling, which I think a lot of people uh, agree with, and universal daycare. Not so sure about that one myself, <laughs> but um, open to discussing it. But a lot of the, and then more generous. Um, uh, allotments for families with children and mm-hmm. so forth. And so this was all, this is all going to cost money. I have to confess, I didn't get to the end of your book where, you know, the final chapter in books like yours is always, you know, here are the 10 bullet points of what we need to do. Um, I don't know if you did a chapter like that, but um, I, I do have to ask you, mm-hmm. How are you going to pay for all this? It's expensive. Yeah, I mean, it is expensive. I'm not, you know, a, uh, a budget fanatic uh, by one means or another. We've, you know, President Trump came in, he just made the budget deficit much, much larger. It continues to be fine. Interest rates are low. Um, I think we should do what we need to do and worry about pay fors sort of secondarily. Uh, But, you know, I'd be for having carbon tax. I'd be for raising more money on congestion pricing. I'd be for taxing the wealthy more heavily. Uh, If we need more money than that, then, you know, in Europe, they use value added taxes, um, that kind of thing. There's also, of course, you know, we the federal government spends money on things that we don't need to be spending money on if we want to cut back in other areas. I mean, to me, though, the most important thing is to make the case for what really does matter and what we really need. And that, to me, is really supporting families with children, including poor ones, but up into the middle class. And to say that, you know, for sort of bowel cost disease reasons, it just it's become harder to maintain a family of two or three or four children than it used to be in the past. But it's important to our society that people be able to have and raise children and that we should make that an important sort of commitment of ours, just as we've made a commitment that people need to be able to retire in dignity and, and other things like that. Uh, and people do say, according to polls, that they are actually having fewer children than they would prefer. Um, so. Yeah, it's been so since 1980, the number of children that people say they would like to have has stayed almost absolutely flat at 2.5. It it went up last year to 2.7 for sort of unknown reasons. Uh, but the number of children people actually have keeps going down and down and down bit by bit by bit. And and people tell pollsters it's because childcare is too expensive. Um, and so, you know, I think we need to do things to provide childcare services to people. I would also say to support stay-at-home parents and stay-at-home mothers realistically, but, you know, you should be able to choose. Uh, you know, we just, we also need to address on the regulatory side, as long as I'm on a conservative show, should acknowledge this, um, some of the things that have been done on the regulatory side that have driven up the cost of parenting uh, for very little benefit. There was a, a study recently about 
uh, car seat regulations. And, you know, car seats are good for, for little kids, but states have sort of moved up the age that you have to keep your kids in, in car seats for, uh, which is fine if you only have one or two kids. But most standard cars can't fit three car seats in them. So you need to be able to buy like a very big, expensive car if you want to have three kids in car seats. So families can't do that. And they sort of do the math on it. And they estimate that there's tens of thousands of sort of children not being had as a result of this higher cost of of, of the car seat regulations versus yeah, something like single digits of lives actually saved by, by, by the safety measure. Now, nobody wants to see children die, obviously. Uh, yeah. But as with anything in the regulatory environment, you know, if you don't actually check your costs and benefits, you wind up overreacting to anecdotes, going too far. And I think mm-hmm. we have done that on a number of child safety fronts. As the economists teach us, it's always there are always trade-offs for everything, um, and you have to be able to balance them. All right. Um, Sarah and Bill, did you want to jump in at any point on any of these points, or should we move on to the next topic? Well, I've got one question. Um, you know, actually, I actually have a lot of questions, but <laughs> in the of time, I'll just focus on this one uh, because it's it's more uh, personal to me, which is, so I'm in that age range, right, where I've got two small kids, a four-year-old and a two-year-old, and we certainly would have liked to have had more. Uh, but one of the reasons that we didn't is because we just were too old. Um, mm-hmm. You know, like by the time we were done educating ourselves and getting as advanced in our careers as we wanted to and we were ready, um, and I think that that's the story for most of my friends. I don't, I can't even think of a friend that I have that's got more than two kids. Now, granted, we live in a, a city with a high education level and that's expensive to live in, expensive to have kids in. Um, but what do you do about the fact that we've just, our society has changed in such a way that where there's a, a large number of people who are going to reproduce who are like, by the time they're ready, they're like 35 mm-hmm. or 33. Yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly the the issue, right? So the the market economy has its own logic, right? And the current logic of the market is that people need quite a number of years of schooling, or if not formal schooling, some kind of practical on the job training, and you don't reach your peak earnings until into your late 30s or or your 40s. And human biology does not follow that same time clock, right? And this is one reason why if we don't do anything proactive, right, if we just sort of leave it to be how it is, we're going to see a diminishing number of children because child care is something that has become more and more costly over time. Other things have gotten cheaper, right? I mean, I'm I'm in my basement uh, working from home and I have my... Uh, HGTV that I bought in 2004. And it it looked amazing to me when I got it back then. And it's like terrifying how much money it cost and how awful it is compared to a, a modern one. Uh, but the march of technology has left us with children being expensive and with prime earnings coming too late to really be in prime childbearing years. And that's why giving financial support to parents is, I think, an idea that makes sense if you value family life in that you know classic way that, I mean, I think social conservatives are most likely to say explicitly, but that you know most people just kind of grasp an intuition of, that if, if we want to be pure libertarians about this, like people just are going to be having fewer and fewer children. Yep. I, I have to say uh, there's data that came out of, you, you mentioned earlier, the Institute for Family Studies. I'm a big fan of their research. They recently came out with a study you may have seen that suggested that while there have been um, declines in mental health for some adults who have been in having really difficult times during the lockdowns and during COVID, especially those who are poor uh, or who um, have lost jobs, of course, or who are caring for an elderly relative, their mental health has suffered. But interestingly, among adolescents, um, their mental health has improved. Uh, They are spending more time with their families. They're talking with their parents more. They're more likely to be sharing dinner with mom and dad or whatever. You know, they're, they're, they're with their parents and it has improved their outlook on life. And something like 53% of the teens they surveyed said that they felt stronger and more resilient after going through this experience. So really interesting data. All right, let us move whoa, now whoa, to... Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, sorry, Bill. I didn't know you were uh, 
getting in on this. Okay, go for it. Yeah, well, you know, I want to I want to play demographer and social scientist for just a minute or two, Matt. And I know you're not unfamiliar uh, with those disciplines or unsympathetic to them. Uh, first of all, I agree with you up to a point. Uh, the most recent estimates out of CBO and the Department of Labor indicate that we're now entering a period where labor force force growth uh, is going to grind to a near halt. It's above 2% when I was a lot younger, and it's going to be about a half of 1% for the foreseeable future. And that has implications for the overall rate of growth uh, and for social dynamism as, as well. I mean, a back of the envelope calculation indicates that to have a labor force growth of a percent and a half which would probably be enough to, to produce 3% growth in the country as a whole, uh, we'd need another million and a half people of working age every year than we're going to get. And so that's a pretty good proxy for the level of expanded immigration that might make sense. Uh, but it's not the case that if, you know, that if more is good, still more is better. Uh, I think it's a U-shaped curve, and that gets to the social science, namely that there's a lot of literature suggesting that periods of higher immigration are periods of diminishing social trust. And at some point, the price in trust is too high, is too high to pay. Uh, so far, you haven't talked very much about the cultural dimension of increased immigration. Sure. Um, you know, I, I, that's one reason why I would not recommend trying to do population growth exclusively through immigration. It, it's it's another dimension through which I think it's important actually to have a sort of natural increase among the population as well, because there are limits naturally as to like how rapidly you can turn over uh, the, the population of a country. I, you know, I would say that if you look back over the past uh, hundred years of the United States of America, our population has more than tripled over that time. So trying to triple it again uh, by the outcome of, of the 21st century is not a completely crazy idea if you think about both immigration and people having children here. Uh, but I do think, you know, this is one reason why I think it's worthwhile for liberals to look at changing the question of how are visas allocated? Because, you know, there are limits. There's limits to what people will take. There's limits to what will work economically. I have been impressed by studies of Europe, which show that communities that have sort of more skilled, more educated immigrants are sort of more welcome and tolerant to them. I think if people want to put a lot of emphasis on English language skills, or if they want to even show favoritism to certain countries or regions, you know, that would be completely reasonable. Uh, the, the trust angle on its own, I'm never quite sure what to make of. You know, Brian Kaplan has looked at this and he points out that there's a lot of you know, coefficients in that regression that seem bigger than immigration, like the home ownership rate and, you, you know, uh, other things like that. So I don't, I don't know exactly what to make of it. Uh, my, my hope is that if we move toward, you know, we've had obviously in the, uh, 90s in particular, and to an extent in the 2000s, we had a tremendous amount of illegal immigration coming from Latin America. And that's been a very, you know, troublesome, thorny issue in American life ever since and, and continues to be. Uh, people don't want to see families and communities ripped apart by deportations. Other people strongly feel that, you know, we need people to follow the law. Um, so I am much more enthusiastic about legal immigration, particularly of skilled workers, to get us to a better place culturally and economically than we've been with immigration in the past. Well, that's part of the story. Uh, I'll grant you that. But, uh, you know, that gets, that gets me to the other prong of my, of my question, which is sort of an objection. Uh, there is a big difference between supporting families with children better 
which I'm all in favor of, and expecting a big pro-natalist bang for that buck. Uh, there's not, you know, uh, birth rates are pretty sticky uh, and tend to be much more responsive to broad social changes like the educational status of women when they have when they choose to have a first child, et cetera. Sarah touched on that on, on those points. And I have to say I'm very skeptical that improved support for child care, for example, which I'm all in favor of, would have more than a one or two tenths of, of a percent effect max on the birth rate. So, you know, what is the evidence that pro-natalist spending spending programs will actually increase the birth rate significantly? Yeah, so I think these programs have developed a uh, excessively negative reputation because they've been mostly implemented by governments of the right, whose predisposition is different from yours, Bill. You know, people who like they really don't want to spend money on helping families with children, but they feel reluctantly like, uh, like maybe we got to do it because otherwise people aren't going to have kids. And then they spend some money very begrudgingly and they look at the results and they say, eh, you know, this was a big disappointment. Uh, but if you if you look at the numbers, uh, L- Lyman Stone at, at IFS looked at this and he says that something like the American Families Act which most Senate Democrats have signed on to, which Joe Biden is pushing, that it would lead to about 0.25 additional births per woman. Um, That's not like, you know, a total game changer, a a complete uh, alteration of the landscape in the United States, but it's also not nothing, right? Um, Going up to, that would get us back to about a replacement rate fertility all on its own. Um, And so if you did a few other things on top of that, you know, you could get it up to, 0.3, 0.35. So my estimate is not that far off of yours uh, in terms of what we see from the the cross-national literatures. And it's not a big enough effect to justify programs that have no other justification. You know what I mean? Like if that was the only benefit, you would say this is a lot of money for a small benefit. Uh, But if you believe that reducing child poverty is important and and all these other things that are also achieved by family supported programs, then I think it's worth taking it into account, right? And saying like, this is something that's real. This is something that I think is a benefit of these kinds of programs. And then, you know, you pair that with some regulatory actions. I I hope to get a bit over that. But I mean, I agree with you. We're not going to go back to a world in which people have seven children routinely uh, because tastes and preferences and religiosity and, you know, women's education, everything else like that is the most important factor. Can I mention something on the topic of childcare? Um, because uh, one of the problems with ideas for universal pre-K um, is that you know we have universal kindergarten, for example, and it and it is not great quality uh, all the time. And arguably, it's even more important that daycare be be excellent quality because those are incredibly formative years for children. Um, there are a few sort of marquee study, you know, uh, preschools, peri preschool that, you know, were staffed by PhDs and so forth and had wonderful results, but they're not replicable on a wide scale. Um, so, you know, how do you handle that problem? I mean, you know, it would be great if all of our kids had high quality daycare, but it's just not realistic. Uh, yeah, I mean, I am not a believer in sort of preschool witchcraft, uh, where, you know, so some people will, you can look at Perry or you can look at, um, Abacadari and you can look at some of these other programs and you're like, wow, Easy for you to say. If, if we could, if we could give every <laughs> child that, you know, things would be amazing, which is true, but like, okay, how, uh, to me, that's actually not the issue, right? It's that, like people like, Kids are doing things uh, as we speak. Um, and right now we have a lot of families who are being crushed by the cost of very, very, very low quality programs. Um, we can do more to help people uh with the financial burdens. And I think that we should, I mean, this is a, a bona fide just disagreement I have with the main democratic proposals here, which is that I think we should try to be neutral between subsidizing center-based care and subsidizing stay-at-home parenting, uh, because I don't think there is compelling evidence that 
the kinds of childcare centers we have are good enough that it makes sense to, to push people into them. Uh, so Quebec did a program, uh, a yes. very big expansion. Um, yes. And, you know, parents liked it, but it seemed uh-huh. like it had negative uh, impacts on average on uh, on the children because in some cases the kids would have been better off at home. So, you know, you can make these things more fiscally neutral than that program. I mean, that was also an incredibly stingy. Uh, they do weird things in Quebec uh, for, for reasons I don't <laughs> always fully understand. Um, so, you know, that that's an extreme case that I think we should right. try to avoid. Boy. We should try. It's a it's it's a warning actually because the the children in Quebec, you know, fifteen years after the uh, after the program had gotten started, they found that the young the, the adolescents who had been in the program had much higher rates of depression, uh, thoughts of suicide, dissatisfaction with life in general. Um, so um, that's worrisome. No, I mean, I, I totally agree. I mean, I, I think yeah. that was not a, you, we, we did, uh, my, my podcast is called The Weeds. Uh, we did one of our, our earliest episodes actually discuss this because it's not, um, it's, it's not quite as well known as it, as it ought to be. Uh, but I mean, again, you know, the question is like, what are you trying to do with these programs and what margin are you operating on? Uh, the Canadians, as I understand it, really wanted to increase mother's labor force participation rate. And that they succeeded. And, and they succeeded, that. right? So, I yes. mean, as as is often the case, it's like you hit the targets that you're aiming for. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't think the United States has any particular reason to like want to do that. I don't think we're like plagued by too many stay-at-home mothers and we need to give everyone, I don't know, you know, but like th- that was their social concern and they achieved what they were looking for. I-, I don't think that's what we need to be addressing. What we do have is a lot of families who are just crushed by the financial burdens of uh, children and we need to give them more money. All right. Well, this is all very, very interesting and important. And uh, thank you so much for getting us started on this conversation. We could, of course, go for hours uh, discussing all the different permutations. But we do want to get to our second topic, which is the uh, Hunter Biden laptop caper. Um, Sarah, do you want to walk us through the facts of the case? This is like law school. Miss Longwell, I, I please stand up and give us the facts of the case. <laughs> I absolutely do not want to be the person to talk us through the facts of the case because my central thesis about this entire thing is that it is immaterial to uh, the world that we live in. Um, it is not going to make a difference to voters. Uh, it is impossible to follow it requires a deep, a deep uh, you have to be very online and you have to want to dive into the depths with people like Rudy Giuliani and, you know, uh, computer repair people and hard drives in Delaware. Blind uh, computer repair people. Yeah. And so I, I, I would not like to walk us through the facts of the case if somebody else would like to, uh, but I will just put my position up front. This is... Uh, not the not the thing that is going to rock this election. All right. Okay. So maybe maybe we'll skip the facts and get to the <laughs> um, to, get to the meta because you know, why should we be different? <laughs> yes, exactly. So so Bill Galston, um, yes. this is the kind of hack and dump attack, possibly from the Russians. It sure looks like it. Rudy Giuliani is involved, and he's been taking stuff from the Russians through Ukraine for a very long time. Um, uh, But so did people overreact? So Twitter and Facebook, you know, sprang into action. You could almost see them, you know, the the sirens going off in Silicon Valley and they're saying, this is it. This is the big dump. This is like that moment in 2016. And this time we're going to do it right. Did they? I am totally with Sarah on this one. Uh, I think it's a non-event. There's at least a 50-50 chance that it's a fraudulent non-event. And I, you know, unlike 2016, I don't think events of this sort are going to have a measurable impact on the outcome of the election. Uh, And for that reason, I haven't bothered to invest scarce time in the details of this issue, uh, or even thinking meta about it. Frankly, I have more important things to think about. 
<laughs> All right. Matt. And not just Bill. Can I just, I'm sorry. I just want to say one thing on this. Go for it. I've been doing these focus groups. You know, I've done like all these focus groups for a long time. I've done like 50 since 2018. And, you know, in the last six months, because we could do them virtually, I've been doing just them at a, at a much higher clip. At no point has anybody brought up Rudy Giuliani or Ukraine or, I mean, we're in the middle of a pandemic. There's 8% unemployment, which is down from catastrophic levels earlier in the summer. There has been cities on fire with racial division. Uh, People are suffering deep personal consequences as a result of what we're going through. The idea that like you have to live in like a Fox News, Breitbart, super online right wing ecosystem to have any idea what's going on. And when you're thinking right now about how to like get your kids back in school safely and that your spouse is furloughed and your small business is shut down. The idea that this would be the thing is just so preposterous to me. Sorry, I'll leave it at that. Nope. I, look, I, I completely understand your position and Bill's and I agree with it, but I'm still going to try to get this question answered and I'm going to try this time with Matt. Matt, uh, did Twitter and Facebook overreact and give the Trump people a talking point by limiting the circulation of this story? Should they have just left it alone, let it be debunked? Well, here I, I, I want to choose my words carefully because 24 hours ago, I would have said Twitter and Facebook shouldn't have done that. They overreacted. Uh, because I was thinking, you know, in terms you talk about in journalism, right? We say all the time, like, Vox shouldn't have covered that that way. The New York Times shouldn't have used that headline. And we're just saying, like, should, right? We're not, I, I'm not saying, like, there should be a law mandating that the New York Times run the headlines that I like. And we started to skid over into, you know, Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley and other people suggesting that somehow like free speech requires the government to set Twitter's editorial policies, which I, which I don't think is right. Uh, but yeah, I mean, they, you know, Twitter especially went way overboard in this. Uh, we, we were having a good discussion on Twitter about this New York Post story, about its provenance, about its relevance to things. Of course, there were some people who were doing crazy stuff, as, as there always are online. But tw- Twitter, I thought, was being, in some ways, Twitter at its best in digesting a sort of new thing quickly for people who are extremely online. And, you know, these companies need to... Um, I am glad to see them acknowledging that they are making, in effect, editorial choices, uh, but they need to get better at making those choices if that's what they're going to do. They need to hire some people who know what they're doing. They need to approach these things with an appropriate level of perspective. Uh, I think they were so geared up for a redux of WikiLeaks and Russian hackers that when something else happened that is superficially similar to that, they just like... They, they went way overboard. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so, uh, so because my, my panel will not cooperate, <laughs> we will never know uh, <laughs> all about the ins and outs of the um, Wilmington, Delaware repair shop where Hunter Biden supposedly dropped off three laptops and never came to pick them up and how the FBI got involved. Just and, don't, uh, don't go to that Apple store. <laughs> they might they might give your stuff to Rudy Giuliani. <laughs> yeah, and that naturally the thing that a, that a that a, a computer repair shop would do when somebody doesn't pick up their goods and doesn't pay for them is call Rudy Giuliani. I mean, I would, wouldn't you? I mean, that's just normal. Anyway, all right. Um <laughs> Let us now discuss something that comes up all the time that people seem to be obsessed with that, you know, we are, you know, as a as a society, let us say, um, still suffering PTSD from the 2016 election. And there are a lot of people out there who cannot really get their minds around the fact that 2020 is not 2016 all over again. So Matt, I'm going to give you the first crack at this one. Um, What would you say to people who say, um, you know, look, the the polls could be, could be wrong in the swing States. And, you know, there could be all of the, you know, all these reasons to think that uh, there's, that we shouldn't believe what our eyes show us. 
I mean, the polls definitely could be wrong. Uh, I, I think the New York Times has a great feature on polling where they they go through the averages in every state. And then they say, what if the polls are off as much as they were in 2016? Uh, and it shows mm-hmm. Biden still wins. Um, he just yeah. He just has a bigger lead. There's fewer undecided voters. There's fewer third party voters. And I think all that's important. I mean, I, I think the biggest- There's fewer third party candidates. Sure. Yeah. Or at least serious ones. The biggest thing that's changed, right, is we had years of stories about how how Trump loves his base, how he cares a lot about what they think, about how the base doesn't trust the media criticism of him. And that's fine. Uh, but what's happening is that the 54% of the electorate uh, that didn't vote for Trump is really coalescing around his opponent uh, because, you know, when an incumbent runs for re-election, he really defines the race. And so some people are for Trump, but more people are not for Trump. It's always been more people not for Trump. Uh, and they're just not fractured the way that they were last time. And so, you know, things can change over the next few weeks, right? I mean, we might have a scoop in the New York Post that's more interesting than something about Hunter Biden seven years ago. Uh, and that could change the race. But where we are now, it, it just looks really bad for Trump. Bill Galston, yeah. I know that you, uh, your grandmother, probably like my grandmother, you know, didn't want to tempt the evil eye, right, <laughs> by by being too optimistic. So uh, you probably have that worry. But uh, but what do you say to all this? Uh, I have to say I'm I'm pretty close to Matt's position. Mm-hmm. Uh, in part, I've just finished I've just finished an analysis of the thirteen states that could possibly be considered swing states. And that analysis is remarkably consistent with the national numbers. That's that's first of all. But secondly, the single biggest mistake in 2016, especially at the state poll level, was the underweighting of white voters without a college education. And, and pollsters at every level have gone to school on that miss, and they have corrected it. So whatever the error will be this time around, and I'm sure there'll be some mistakes, it won't be attributable to that mega mistake, which really skewed the exit polls, as well as the polls taken before the election. Uh, And to put it as simply as possible, There are more state polls by far than there were in 2016, and their average quality is much higher, which means that the average of of a poll in each state is more likely to be reliable within a range of possible uh, error uh, than was the case four years ago. Uh, In addition, I ask myself a qualitative question How many new friends? as Donald Trump made in the past four years? I can't think of a lot. But if I ask myself how many new enemies has he made, that's a much longer list. Uh, And so in order for the current uh, poll pattern that we're looking at to be fundamentally wrong, it must be the case, and I don't say that this is metaphysically impossible, uh, that his relentless focus on his base will create a white working class turnout, the likes of which we've never seen in our country's history. Maybe that will happen. But in order for that to be decisive, it would have to be coupled by a dramatic shortfall on the other side of the ledger. And all of the evidence suggests that turnout will be massive uh, across the board. It already is. It already is. But there's always the... there There's... There's always the question of whether early voting is cannibalizing later voting. We don't mm-hmm. know. We don't know whether these massive early voting figures are really predictive of a massive increase in turnout. But I think there will be a massive increase in turnout. As you know, the midterm turnout in 2018 was the highest as a share of eligible voters in more than a century. And I would not be a bit surprised to see that repeated in 2020. There's there's one aspect, though, um, Bill, that really has me scratching my head. 
uh, Trump, you said, has he made any new friends? You know who he's made some new friends of? Black men. <laughs> I mean, that's weird, right? His sport no, among no, black no, no, men. No, 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 no. He's made some, you know, if we're going to go down this road, he's made a few new friends among Latino men yeah. as well, right? And now, in the case of black men, I think we're talking about a three-point gain from 11% to 14% in a group that is much less likely to vote than, for example, black women. True. So let us, you know, you know this is a very modest development, but uh, I will not so cheerfully acknowledge uh, that there's a share of my gender uh, that would you know, like permission to behave the way Donald Trump behaves and would like to restore some kind of gender hierarchy. Uh, and uh, he's making it possible for them to acknowledge this with their votes as well as their conduct. And uh, there's nothing much we can do about that. Sarah, um, in West Virginia, which is a pretty white uh of, of low, you know, uh, working class state. Uh, Trump won it in 2016 by 42 points. Um, today he's he's winning it, but only by 23 points. So, which which we've seen reflected all across the country that he has lost support even with the white non college cohort, which is the the core of his base. Yeah, and I think if you dug into the crosstabs there, one of the things that you would see is a real cratering with women, both college and non-college, even among people who voted for him last time. I mean, look, one of the key elements of why 2016 is different from 2020, uh, there's 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 two big things uh, that I've gleaned from doing uh, all of these focus groups. One is, look, everybody, when I ask these women, especially, that's who I'm talking to, both college and non-college women, for the most part. Hey, why did you vote for Donald Trump in 2016? They always say the same thing. They say, I didn't vote for Donald Trump. I voted against Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. And Hillary Clinton's not on the ballot this time. Donald Trump wishes that she were. It's the reason <laughs> he's talking about her emails and other yep. things that also make no, they, they make no difference to people's lives. The other thing is that um, people were really taking a chance on him. They were like, you know, yeah, he was kind of a jerk, but I thought maybe he would be good for jobs, good for the economy. And so they were willing to overlook a bunch of things. Uh, you know, they're not they're not blind to his foibles and, and deficiencies. Um, but then for three and a half years, they've watched him govern. And look, it was chaotic in the beginning and, and, and people didn't like that he was divisive, but the economy was still doing OK. So people were kind of hanging in there. But then we had a pandemic hit and an attending economic crisis and a racial crisis. And I watched in real time as he alienated all of the voters that he needed to, to win over to have any hope of repeating what he did in 2016. And women who were forgiving just enough of his behavior because things the economy was good, like they don't have a reason to stick around right now. The only thing they have and the only thing Donald Trump has tried to to do is to say, well, the left is worse. Like they're socialists, so you know it's it's about trying to drive, um, trying to drive that negative polarity, and that works with some mm -hmm. with with a percentage of people, but it doesn't work with everybody, and and I don't think it's working with enough people, and especially with women. I mean, Trump is or, so uh, it's like the 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 percentage of women that Donald Trump is winning is roughly. 33 to 34% to Joe Biden's 60%. You cannot be down by that much with women and win an election. I mean, he won the plurality of white women in 2016. He has no shot at doing that again this time. I mean, he just, he had to broaden his base and he's, he hasn't done it because he hasn't done a good job as president. And it's almost that simple. Did you see a Big response uh, to the debate performance. I, I have the sense that that was really the last straw for a lot of people. Yeah, it's such a it's such a good point because, you know, I think a lot of people are like, well, people must just really think the fact that he got COVID is, you know, just that's got to be the thing. But it's not. You know, what people do when they, they found out he had COVID is like they roll their eyes and they're like, yeah, of course he did. Like, well, you know, the guy doesn't wear a mask. He's not careful. But that's not the thing. They People went into the debate actually looking for answers. 
right? People genuinely want to know what are either of these candidates going to do to improve their lives because their lives aren't great right now. And to have Donald Trump come in like a maniac and just interrupt and bluster and look just really unfit. Um, that I all the focus groups that I've done, people just say I was so turned off, and I closed the I closed any possibility to voting for Donald Trump again. Like they were still waiting, there were still people who were like, you know, if he really showed me something there, I would have come back in. But they all said, I'm done, I'm out. Yeah. Uh, okay, Matt, did you have something on this? You know, I just think it's also worth giving credit where due to. Joe Biden himself, who is not a dynamo of charisma um, or the most exciting or or even best loved politician in America, but has really, you know, studiously all the way going back to the primary, tried hard to avoid unpopular policies and things about the left that alienate people. Um, You know, Hillary Clinton is very much seen by progressive activists as from the moderate establishment wing of the party. But she, to I think a greater extent than a lot of Democrats appreciated, indulged um, a lot of tropes, leftist tropes that that people don't like. Uh, Whereas Biden has really studiously portrayed himself as a mainstream person with normal, you know, moderate-ish values and somewhat progressive economic policies. And that's just made it a lot easier for him to win. I I think some of the other candidates in the field could also have beaten Trump under these conditions, but Biden has made the right choices to be someone who's acceptable to a majority of the public. Yep. Found the sweet spot. Bill, did you have something else? I had a question for Sarah, but if there's not time for it. No, it's okay. Go go for it. Uh, Well, You know, Sarah, I had the same take on the first debate that that you did and publicly compared compared it to what turned out to be the only Reagan Carter debate where Reagan's Reagan's performance gave people permission uh, to support him. Here's my question. Uh, is the did the first debate slam the door shut such that even a different Donald Trump in the second debate couldn't reopen it? You know, it's a really good question um, because I think, look, all of us have 2016 PTSD and think yep, like, yep, yep, oh, yep. man, who knows what this guy could just pull out. And like he goes into this town hall tonight and he's conciliatory and he's got, you know, plans and he's really winning people over. The only thing is about that uh, is that, you know, when I'm listening to these voters, like what they're really looking for are concrete things. Like people are aware that Donald Trump does not have a health care plan. People are aware that he doesn't, ha- he's not taking coronavirus seriously at all. And it matters a great deal to their lives that somebody think about how to take this virus seriously and get it under control. And so I sort of think at this point he'd have to he'd have to have more than just one good performance to bring it all back home. Now look, I think that we should all hope that it doesn't happen but probably expect some natural tightening as there's some breaking towards the end of people who say, "Look, I've just never voted for a Democrat before. I'm going to vote for Donald Trump, I don't want my taxes to go up. And some of those like bread and butter type things. Um, But just based on what I've seen, I see this real shift happening where people who voted third party last time because they said a pox on both their houses, those people are breaking overwhelmingly for Biden. And what I see in my groups is people who are either willing to vote for Biden and cross the Rubicon or who are saying, I'm going to vote third party or I'm going to opt out. And I think they are just overwhelmingly shifting away from him, where the third party voters this time, where last time it peeled off from Hillary Clinton, this time they're going to peel off for Trump. If it were just the elderly and women who had soured on Trump, that would have been enough to have him lose the election. Uh, But it's lots of other voters as well. So uh, he's, uh, he's in deep, 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 deep trouble. All right, let us now turn to our final segment, highlights or lowlights, things we want to draw attention to. Um, Let's start with you, Bill. Well, not for the first time, and I suspect not for the last, 
Uh, I want to commend a piece by one of America's best political journalists, Ron Brownstein. Uh, he does he does two essays a week, one for the Atlantic, the other for CNN. Today's CNN piece is a wonderful, detailed unpacking of of the fundamental changes that are occurring in the politics of the Southwest in the United States, particularly Arizona and Texas. It's a great read, although I suspect Democrats will like it better than me. <laughs> Sarah. You know, um, this is a thing. So I've, I've obviously been a Republican my entire life. I have doubted some of the claims of active voter suppression across the country. Uh, but I find myself constantly seeing these uh, images online of these like horrendously long lines like people standing in line for 11 hours to vote on the first day. And uh, part of me is like, hey, guys, this is early voting. Like, you don't have to do it on the first day. Like, in five days, it's like, you know, those lines will probably be shorter. I also, I wonder all the time how people are going to the bathroom in these situations. Like, <laughs> yeah. I just, I, but, but to me, I, I just think that as a like I, and I'm with I'm with Matt here. I am a USA chanting person. This is the greatest country in the world. We should be able to vote in under an hour. Like these lines are uh, and I think sometimes people post these things as like they're supposed to be inspirational because look how tough all these people are because they're standing in line, you know, waiting to exercise their right to vote. And I'm glad they're doing it. But it is preposterous that that is uh, the situation. And um, I think right, left, or center, we have an obligation to figure out how to improve voting in this country. I'm going to beg to differ. Um, so in a normal year uh, of voting, there are certain precincts, certain areas where there are terrible long lines and terrible waits, and that is unconscionable and needs to be fixed. But this year, I'm a little more indulgent. Everything is so weird. They don't know how many people are going to show up for early voting. They don't know how to staff it. Um, everything is just thrown into a cocked hat. So I, I'm a little bit more willing to say these are, these could be just honest, you know, failures to prepare because the, everything is so hard to predict. All right. I'm going to, um, cite a piece by a former guest on this podcast, Brett Stevens of the New York times. Uh, he wrote a piece called the 1619 Chronicles that I, think was very brave. And I'm, I want to praise Brett for writing it. First of all, it was very, very balanced. He, he was critiquing his own newspaper uh, for, for their long series on the called 1619 Project. Uh, and, uh, and he was suggesting that they, you know, that, that journalists write the first draft of history, as I think he put it, um, not the last word. And there was too much of the last wordism in the 1619 Project, as if to say, this is the only you know, reasonable way to interpret American history. Um, and he had other criticisms too, as well as some praise. And it was, um, it was extremely well done. But I also want to praise the newspaper for running it. Uh, it was very, you know, it was about double the length of a normal column. They gave it a lot of play. And that's exactly what a great newspaper should do. They should not suppress dissent and it should be a free and open forum for, um, for, for uh, various voices from different sides. So bravo to both Brett and the New York Times. Matt, we don't force our guests to do a uh, final segment. So if you don't have one, I'm just going to say thanks so much for joining us. And thank you, Sarah, for sitting in today. This was great. And uh, we will return next week, like every week. And thank you all for listening. 